to the UFO Rabbit Hole podcast. I'm your host, Kelly Chase. In the last episode, we talked about how the Pentagon made the announcement that three previously leaked videos of UFOs filmed by Navy pilots were authentic. And even more stunning, they have no idea what they are or who they might belong to. So if you're anything like me, the only thing you want to talk about right now is what these things could possibly be. So let's just dive into it. The first and most obvious possibility is that the things that we're seeing in the sky are ours, as in they are heretofore unknown terrestrial man-made technology that has somehow been kept a secret from the general public. So let's entertain this idea. If these are man-made objects displaying technology that is advanced far beyond anything that we've ever seen before, the immediate question becomes, okay, but who exactly is making them? And considering the insane amount of capital that would be needed to develop something so far ahead of our current understanding, there can really only be two culprits. The government, whether ours or someone else's, or private aerospace and defense companies. It's worth noting that there are some people out there who think it could be some rogue, Tony Stark-style billionaire genius developing this on their own. And for some people, this person is specifically Elon Musk. And... All I'll say to that is that you shouldn't listen to people who think that Elon Musk is a real-life Tony Stark and not a real-life Philip K. Dick villain. Also, consider that billionaires Sir Richard Branson, Jeff Bezos, and Elon Musk, the last two of which are currently in a race to see who's going to be the world's first trillionaire, have all created aerospace companies that are tripping over themselves to secure lucrative government contracts for tasks as mundane as shooting satellites into space. Why would they be wasting their time with that if they'd already developed paradigm-breaking technology? It doesn't make a ton of sense. It's also unlikely that a private company would be able to develop this kind of technology without the government catching on. And even if they were able to do so, a company's sole purpose is to generate profits for shareholders. So even if they did have this kind of technology, their first move would be to turn around and try to sell it to the government. So we can pretty safely rule out private companies. However, while it's virtually impossible that any private individual or enterprise would be able to develop this kind of technology without the government knowing about it, it's also true that it's unlikely the government would be able to develop this kind of technology and keep it quiet without the assistance of private entities. The U.S. government has a long history of outsourcing top-secret projects to private companies, allowing those projects to dodge the oversight they'd be subjected to if they were housed within a government agency. For example, Lockheed Martin's notoriously secretive Skunk Works division was started in 1943 in the heat of World War II, when the U.S. government needed to quickly develop the country's first jet fighter to compete with the new German jets that were appearing in the skies over Europe. Four years later, they developed the U-2, the very first dedicated spy plane that the CIA originally tried to pass off as a high-altitude plane developed for weather research, but which was actually used to take crystal-clear photos of the Soviet Union from 70,000 feet. So there is precedence for the U.S. government and private aerospace and defense companies working on projects in this sort of hand-in-glove manner. And if these crafts are, in fact, the property of the U.S. government, they were almost certainly developed in partnership with private companies. So that's one possibility. The other possibility is even more disturbing. Could it be one of our adversaries? Could Russia or China have developed this technology without us knowing about it? It's technically feasible, but at this point, it seems unlikely. First of all, it would represent the largest intelligence failure in U.S. history, And given the scale and power of the United States intelligence apparatus, that would be a stunning development, to say the least. The other issue with this theory is that the earliest of the declassified Navy videos we discussed in the last episode is from the Nimitz incident in 2004. So we have confirmation from the Pentagon that this phenomenon has been going on at least since then. If our adversaries had this kind of technology almost 20 years ago, it begs the question, What are they waiting for? Looking back at the five observables outlined by former ATIP director Lou Elizondo, anti-gravity, instantaneous acceleration, cloaking, hypersonic speed without signatures, and transmedium travel, 
Any one of those things would represent an absolute paradigm shift, not just in weapons, defense, and intelligence systems, but in the ways in which we produce and use energy. The potential and the possibilities are sweeping and profound. Meanwhile, we've spent the last 20 years engaged in both covert and overt wars in the Middle East, and multiple squabbles and proxy wars with Russia and China and others around the globe. The level of technology displayed by these objects is more than sufficient to bring the U.S. military to heel and seize control of the global power structures. If one of our adversaries was holding that kind of trump card, why wouldn't they play it? It's also hard to think of a logical reason why the Pentagon would admit to the existence of these crafts and admit that they have no idea what they are if they thought there was even a sliver of a possibility that they could belong to another country. That is just not the kind of intelligence that you would ever offer up. It would be dangerous to let the enemy know that they'd caught you flat-footed and that you didn't know what you were dealing with. You'd also lose the competitive advantage of other countries assuming that the technology could possibly be American. We only need to look at the Cold War to understand how a government would approach the threat of another country potentially developing weapons and technology that are far superior to their own. I'm not saying that it's not possible that these craft could belong to another country, but if that's the case, this just isn't at all how you'd expect the U.S. government to respond. So do with that what you will. So let's assume for a minute that the Pentagon is lying for some reason, and they do know what these craft are because they belong to us. What evidence is there that could support this theory? Well, to start with, our government has pretty clearly lied to us about UFOs before. Most people don't realize how much of our perception of the UFO phenomenon is shaped by some pretty seriously revisionist history. Having been raised in a culture and an environment where talk of UFOs and aliens has been consistently responded to with ridicule and mockery, it can be hard to imagine that there was a time when this topic was taken seriously by the government, scientists, and the public at large. But there was. You've probably heard about the Roswell incident in 1947, where witnesses claimed to have seen a vehicle that can only be described as a flying saucer, that it allegedly crash-landed at a ranch in New Mexico. That very day, the U.S. Intelligence Office of the 509th Bombardment Group at Roswell Army Airfield confirmed to the local evening newspaper, the Roswell Daily Record, that they had recovered a, quote, flying disc, unquote, before changing their story the next day to say that they had been mistaken and it was actually a crashed weather balloon. Now, the truth of what actually happened isn't really important to this conversation, so I don't want to get bogged down there. All that matters right now is how the government responded to this incident and to the escalating rash of UFO sightings that were happening across the country in 1947. Because while outwardly brushing off these incidents as being easily explainable by known natural phenomena, internally, the U.S. military was taking this potential threat very seriously. In September 1947, just two months after the Roswell incident, General Nathan Twinning, a former combat fighter pilot, World War II commander, and the head of the United States Air Material Command, wrote in a now-famous letter that the UFO phenomenon was, quote, something real and not visionary or fictitious, end quote. He described the existence of metallic-looking disks that showed incredibly advanced capabilities and that appeared to be intelligently piloted or remotely controlled. He subsequently recommended the formation of what became known as Project Sign to study this phenomenon. Project Sign eventually was renamed as Project Grudge and then as Project Blue Book in 1952. While early reports from Project Sign suggested that these UAPs could potentially be of Soviet origin, by 1952, the multitude of reports that Project Blue Book was studying, many from highly credible witnesses, including those within the U.S. military, were being routinely dismissed as everything from rare atmospheric anomalies to mass hysteria to deliberate hoaxes in their reports. However, it's clear from now declassified documents that while the government was reassuring the public, it was still treating this phenomenon as an active threat. In July 1952, in a series of incidents over multiple days, at least 10 glowing UAPs were seen by countless people in the skies above the White House and the U.S. Capitol building, at one point for six straight hours, and were tracked on radar at Washington, D.C.'s National Airport. 
Fighter jets were scrambled, but each time they got close to the UAPs, they disappeared or took off at speeds that made them impossible to chase. The incident was front page news around the globe, and even President Truman demanded answers. The official explanation, which was delivered to the American people by U.S. Air Force Director of Intelligence Major General John Samford in the biggest press conference since World War II, dismissed these incredible events as a freak weather phenomena. Nothing to see here. And yet, just three months later, the CIA's Assistant Director of Scientific Intelligence wrote the following in a now declassified secret memo. Quote, Flying saucers pose two elements of danger which have national security implications. The first involves mass psychological considerations, and the second concerns the vulnerability of the United States to an air attack. Whether these UFO incidents being reported were legitimate or not doesn't change the only conclusion that can really be drawn here, which is that the official story that was being fed to the public was not at all an accurate representation of what was happening behind the scenes. And considering that, as was first exposed in the 2017 New York Times article, programs for studying UAPs have continued to exist within the Pentagon up through the present day. It's nearly impossible to accept the idea that the government thought this was all just pranksters and swamp gas. So, we do know for a fact that the government has a record of being dishonest about what it knows and doesn't know about UAPs. So, is there any evidence that they are lying now when they say that they don't know what this phenomenon is? Is there any evidence to suggest that this could actually be our technology? Well, it turns out there is. Although it's extremely circumstantial, it is compelling enough to be noted. As I mentioned a little earlier, one of the most obvious things about developing this sort of super advanced technology is that it would be expensive. Like, really, really expensive. We're talking about the kinds of numbers that just break your brain and make it hard to really grasp their sheer magnitude. Let me put it this way. The most expensive military plane in the world is the Northrop Grumman B-2 Spirit. It costs $2.1 billion and $135,000 an hour to operate. And that's with technology that we understand. The cost to develop the kind of ridiculously advanced craft that are being tracked in our skies and beneath our oceans would be absolutely astronomical, potentially into the hundreds of billions or even trillions of dollars. The spending power of the United States is mind-boggling, but could the government really spend and hide trillions of dollars without us knowing? It turns out that they actually do this all the time, through unsupported budgetary adjustments. The adjustments are done to balance the books when there is an expense that can't be accounted for with the proper documentation. Basically, the money was spent, but no one can find the receipt. Except, we aren't talking about minor discrepancies here. In 2015 alone, the U.S. Army failed to provide adequate support for $6.5 trillion in spending. And between 1998 and 2015, it's estimated that $21 trillion in spending from the Department of Defense and the Department of Housing and Urban Development is completely unaccounted for. The money was spent on something. We just have no idea what. Now, it's important to remember that, as we discussed in the last episode, correlation does not equal causation. So just because trillions of dollars disappeared doesn't mean that the U.S. spent it on developing the paradigm-smashing technological objects that are being recorded in our skies. This is just about assessing what is possible so that we can eliminate the impossible. So we've established that the government has a track record of lying to the American people about this phenomenon. And with $21 trillion of taxpayer money seemingly in the wind, they could conceivably have had the money to fund a massive black budget project like this. And there's another possibility as well, which is that the Pentagon is actually lying about all of this, and the technology doesn't exist at all. They faked the videos and the slow crawl to disclosure that the UFO community has been watching with rapt attention is nothing more than an elaborately orchestrated psyop designed to manufacture a fake alien threat in order to, I don't know, something about money and the military industrial complex and endless secret wars. I told you, I fucking hate this theory. It's not that I don't admit that it could have some merit, but I can't think of anything more bleak or depressing. The good news is that, as you'll see as we dig into the history of the United States with regard to this phenomenon, it's at least my personal opinion that this has been way too well documented for way too long for this to be simply a sucky, stupid, cynical psyop. So there is hope for us yet. 
But the biggest and most obvious evidence that this technology could be human is that although the government is faking an alien threat in order to consolidate power and get a rubber stamp for military spending, sounds pretty crazy when you say it out loud. As you'll see, it's the least crazy theory by far. Don't get me wrong. If that's what's actually going on, it's one of the wildest things that's ever happened in human history. But unlike the other options, it doesn't require us to go back to the drawing board on literally everything we know about history, science, and our place in the universe. And based on that fact alone, you might be thinking, okay, well then, why are we even considering any other options? If this is the only explanation that makes sense given our current understanding, then why are we wasting our time on any of this other nonsense? And I hear you on that. I really do. And that was basically my stance on the issue when I first started down this rabbit hole. After all, I come from a medical family, and one of the first things that they teach new doctors about diagnosing illnesses is that when you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras. The extraordinary does happen, but very, very rarely. That's what makes it extraordinary. And to justify shredding everything we know about the universe and our place in it, we'll need evidence of something that is more than just extraordinary. So is this a waste of time? Maybe. (laughs) Probably. I'm not going to lie to you. If we're just looking at statistical likelihood, it does not look great. But Let's not forget that there have been major paradigm shifts throughout human history that have turned everything on its head, revelations that forced us to go back to the drawing board as a species on all that we know to be true. For example, dating back to the time of Aristotle in the 4th century BC, the prevailing belief was that the cosmos, which at the time consisted of everything that we could see in the sky with our naked eye, revolved around the earth in perfectly circular orbits. The earth was quite literally the center of God's creation. It wasn't until almost 600 years later, in the 2nd century AD, that the astronomer Ptolemy recognized through observation that the heavenly bodies didn't actually appear to move in circular orbits. They moved forward and backward across the night sky in ways that shouldn't have been possible if their orbits were truly circular. This caused Ptolemy to develop his own model that showed the celestial bodies in more elaborate orbits that accounted for their movement in the sky well enough that it became the primary predictive model of astronomy for the next thousand years. But he was still working with the same fundamental and false assumptions, that the planets, moon, and sun were orbiting the Earth in perfectly circular orbits, and that it was only a matter of perspective that made it appear otherwise. So Ptolemy was successful in developing a model of the cosmos that was accurate enough to be predictive, but the truth of what he was observing was still hidden from him and the rest of humanity for the next 1,400 years. Now there's a humbling thought. It wasn't until 1543 that Copernicus detailed his radical theory of the universe in which the Earth, along with all the other planets, rotated around the sun. And even then, his theory took more than a century and the invention of the telescope, to become widely accepted. And yet, there were still pieces of the puzzle missing. But those pieces of the puzzle were so revolutionary and so far beyond our understanding at the time that hardly anyone even noticed. Once Isaac Newton defined the laws of motion and gravity in his book, Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, almost 150 years later, in 1687, scientists believe that they finally had it all figured out. And after 210 years of feeling smug, in 1897, the physicist William Thomson Lord Kelvin famously concluded, there is nothing new to be discovered in physics now. All that remains is more and more precise measurement. Which is super awkward for him, considering that less than 10 years later, Albert Einstein began to publish work on his theory of relativity in what amounts to one of the greatest and most profound scientific discoveries in human history. Einstein found that Newtonian physics depended on the assumption that mass, time, and distance are constant regardless of where you measure them. The theory of relativity, on the other hand, treats time, space, and mass as fluid things, defined by an observer's position and frame of reference. All of us on the Earth are in a single frame of reference, but an astronaut in a fast-moving spaceship would be in a different frame of reference. If you're measuring something from a single frame of reference— The laws of classical physics, including Newton's laws, hold true, 
But Newton's laws can't explain the differences in motion, mass, distance, and time that result when objects are observed from two very different frames of reference. For example, a clock on a satellite orbiting the Earth at 14,000 kilometers per hour in an orbit that circles the Earth twice per day is moving much faster than any of the clocks on Earth. Because of the theory of relativity, we actually know that the clocks that are moving faster tick slower. And if this clock is 20,000 kilometers above the Earth, it's experiencing one quarter of the amount of gravity as the clocks on Earth, which will actually make it tick faster. The net impact would be that the clock on the satellite would move 38 microseconds per day faster than the clocks on the ground. If that hurts your brain a little, you're not alone. It's a super advanced concept that requires that you put aside everything that you think you know about the fabric of your reality. You can't really do anything but marvel at the kind of brain that could look so far beyond its own observed experience to understand something so profound. But even Einstein could be a victim of his own assumptions and prejudices. Einstein actually spent most of his life thinking that there was a flaw in his theory of relativity. His math seemed to suggest that the universe was expanding and doing so at an increasing rate. But the idea was so outrageous at the time that Einstein dismissed it and instead introduced the idea of a cosmological constant to counter what the math was showing. It was essentially just a way to fudge the numbers to make his theory conform to what he believed must be true. But that all changed when Edwin Hubble proved the universe was, in fact, expanding at an increasing rate. Einstein called his personal refusal to accept what the math was showing him because he didn't think it was possible the greatest blunder of his career. So where I'm going with all of this is that, although they are rare, throughout history there has been a progression of massive paradigm shifts in the way that we view ourselves and our place in the cosmos. And right up until those discoveries were made, and often until long after, people were convinced that the science of their day had already answered all the questions that could be asked. We shouldn't allow ourselves to recognize the arrogance of that without also turning inward and recognizing that arrogance within ourselves. It's easy to look around the world and at our stunning rate of technological advancement and believe, as Lord Kelvin did, that there's nothing new to be discovered, only more precise measurement. Unfortunately for our egos, that's almost certainly not true. Because while the theory of relativity briefly unified physics into a mostly coherent whole, Quantum physics blew it apart again, and we still haven't quite figured out how to clean up that mess. You've probably heard about the famous double-slit experiment, but here's a quick refresher in case you don't sit around thinking about quantum mechanics all day. So imagine that you have a board with two vertical slits cut into it. If you shine a light at the board, the light waves will go through the slits, and as the waves of light overlap and interfere with each other, it will create a repeating pattern on the wall behind the board called an interference pattern. But as you probably recall, light can also exist as a particle called a photon. And what's crazy is that when scientists fire a single photon at a time at the two slits, it still creates an interference pattern on the wall, indicating that each photon is somehow going through both slits, meaning that it is behaving like a wave and not like a single particle. Even weirder is that if scientists then introduce a sensor to observe each photon going through the slits, then the photon will start to act like a photon and go through only one slit. And as they continue to fire one photon at a time, the photons end up in two straight lines instead of the interference pattern created by light waves. So what this means is that light can behave like a particle and a wave at the same time. And the mere act of observing the experiment will force the light to behave as one or the other. Now, putting to the side for the time being that this suggests that consciousness has an active role in the creation of our lived reality, insert mind-blown emoji here, this created a major divide in physics that still hasn't been totally resolved. I'll tell you about it real quick because who doesn't love a good old-fashioned physics beef? So, taking us back to high school physics again real quick, do you remember the Schrodinger cat experiment? For any cat lovers out there, of which I am one, I will preface this by saying that it was a thought experiment and not something that Schrodinger actually did. So in this thought experiment, Schrodinger imagined putting a cat in a box with a sealed vial of cyanide with a small hammer hanging over the vial. 
The hammer was connected to a Geiger counter, which detects radioactivity, and that counter would be near a tiny lump of slightly radioactive metal. The second that the metal released even a tiny bit of radiation, the hammer would smash the vial and the cat would die. Schrodinger's experiment would then basically involve putting the cat into this contraption for a set period of time and then opening the box to find out the cat's fate. According to quantum mechanics, because the radiation from the lump of metal is composed of subatomic particles, without an observer, it both will and will not be emitted while the box is closed, implying that until it's opened, the cat is both dead and alive at the same time. And Schrodinger saw that there was a major issue with this. Because it's one thing to say that a photon can go down two different paths at once, and another to say that a cat can be both alive and dead at the same time. It seemed to him that although quantum physics could explain how very tiny objects behave, so well that we've developed lasers, LED lights, and space probes, it was completely at odds with the rest of our observable experience. However, most of Schrodinger's contemporaries completely dismissed his concerns. Many actually had no issue with the cat being both alive and dead inside the box until it was forced into a state of aliveness or deadness once it was observed. Despite not being able to explain how that was possible, they just went with it. But most of them, including revered physicist Niels Bohr, thought that the question was meaningless. Bohr's argued in the famous Bohr's-Einstein debates that the inside of the box was, by definition, unobservable and that only things that can be observed and measured have meaning. So in other words, this is the quantum equivalent of asking, if a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound? And the official answer is, don't worry about it. I don't know about you, but I don't find don't worry about it to be a compelling or convincing answer to what is undoubtedly one of the biggest questions in modern physics. But that's exactly where, with notable exceptions, most of the scientific community stands on these issues today. It's the very essence of what it is to be human, to want to understand where we come from and why we're here. But we need to be careful that our desire to find those answers doesn't cause us to say, don't worry about it, to the evidence that doesn't make sense within our current paradigm. So to bring us back to where we started this crazy tangent— The question we're trying to answer was whether it even makes sense for us to consider alternative explanations for the UFO phenomenon, besides them being secret human technology, despite the fact that this is the only explanation that doesn't require us to rip up our science and history books. And for me, the answer is yes. And the reason why is that there's enough pieces of incongruent data that just don't quite fit together. And for questions this big, I don't think we should accept don't worry about it as an answer. However, we still need to proceed cautiously. As Carl Sagan so wisely said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. We can't just go ripping up the textbooks until we're absolutely certain about what the data is telling us. And so we have to accept that we might never get the answers that we're looking for. These sorts of quantum leaps in our understanding about the nature of our reality move on their own timeline. Sometimes, like in the last century, a lot happens all at once. But sometimes humanity works on a problem for hundreds of years before collecting enough evidence to make a major breakthrough. Right now, we're at the point where we have enough information to start to know which questions to ask. But there's no way for us to know how long it might be before these mysteries reveal their secrets to us. So are you still in? (laughs) Then let's do this. So what is the evidence that the government is telling the truth and that this isn't human technology? Well, to start, although the declassified Navy videos were all from the 2000s, the UFO phenomenon has been well documented for at least the past 80 years. Before the Pentagon made its announcement that UAPs are real and that they don't know what they are, we had the luxury of brushing off the thousands upon thousands of UFO sightings. It was a hoax. It was swamp gas reflecting off of Venus. It was a weather balloon. And to be fair, a bunch, maybe even the vast majority of those sightings have rational explanations. But now that the government is saying that UAPs exist, we no longer have the luxury of saying, don't worry about it. I don't know about you, but when I got to this point, I actually felt kind of silly. With so much evidence that something weird was going on in the sky— How did I dismiss it so thoroughly and without question? 
Because although the government has done a masterful job of not just denying that the phenomenon exists, but making it taboo for people to even talk about it, I'm shocked at the level of cognitive dissonance that it took to not see something that seems so obvious now. We've been conditioned into believing carefully crafted stereotypes about people who report encountering UFOs. We assume they're uneducated, ignorant, and they almost certainly have to have a screw loose. But there are scores of cases where the people making these reports are highly credible people who fled from the spotlight, never made a dime off their stories, and have in some cases had their lives and careers destroyed by coming forward, leading one to ask, why would they lie? In their other cases, where the credibility of the witnesses themselves becomes almost irrelevant due to the sheer number of people who saw the same thing at the same time. For example, in March 1997, hundreds, if not thousands of people reported seeing an enormous V-shaped craft with five lights on the bottom flying low over Phoenix, Arizona, with multiple people recording it from vantage points across the city. Witnesses have never been satisfied with the government's explanation that the lights were caused by flares dropped by the Air Force during training exercises and continue to search for answers. Even the former governor, who played a major role in minimizing and ridiculing the incident in the press, has since come forward to apologize to the witnesses. He now says that he saw the craft as well and that he could only describe it as otherworldly. I'd love to talk more about the Phoenix Lights and other hard-to-dismiss sightings from the last century. There are some crazy ones, but I don't want to get bogged down here. So next week, I'm going to release a bonus episode where we'll dive deeper into some of the most credible sightings in history. However, if you don't want to wait, you can go to uforabbithole.com and sign up for the email list, and I'll send you that bonus episode before it's released to the public next week. And as always, my Patreon subscribers get every episode and every bonus episode delivered to them at least 48 hours before it goes live. You can find the links for both in the show notes. So moving on. The thing that makes this whole thing even stickier is that although it's generally accepted that the first report of a flying saucer was by a pilot named Kenneth Arnold in 1947, who made his sighting while searching for a lost plane near Mount Rainier, strange things have been seen in the sky for a long time before that. And though pre-industrial, pre-flight people may not have had the same words and frame of reference as their 20th century counterparts, what they described seeing in the air sounds very similar to modern-day UAP sightings. In his groundbreaking 1969 work, Passport to Magonia, venerated ufologist Jacques Vallée presented 923 eyewitness accounts of strange objects and aerial phenomena from around the globe, spanning the 100 years between 1868 and 1968. Here's just a few. In July 1968 in Chile, he reports, a strange aerial construction bearing lights and making engine noises flew low over this town. Local people also described it as a giant bird covered with large scales producing a metallic noise. In 1877, in Great Britain, it was reported that a strange being dressed in tight-fitting clothes and a shining helmet soared over the heads of two sentries who fired without result. And in April 1897, in Everest, Kansas, the whole town saw an object fly under the cloud ceiling. It came down slowly, then flew away very fast to the southeast. When directly over the town, it swept the ground with its powerful light. It was seen to rise up at a fantastic speed until barely discernible, then come down again and sweep low over the witnesses. At one point, it remained stationary for five minutes at the edge of a low cloud, which it illuminated. All could clearly see the silhouette of the craft. And these are just three of over 900 recorded sightings. Many of them, like these three accounts, were reported years, if not decades, before the Wright brothers first achieved human flight in 1903. And the uncomfortable reality is that strange things have been reported in the sky for centuries, and perhaps even millennia, even appearing in the earliest written records and religious texts that we have. It's impossible to know exactly what, if anything, people were actually seeing back then, or how many of these cases were a genuine case of mistaken identity or mass hysteria or a hoax. And yet, you quickly realize that any effort to draw a line in the sand and declare that any particular incident or time period marks the definitive beginning of the UFO phenomenon would be entirely arbitrary 
Whether real or imagined, this is an experience that people have been having for a very long time. And that's a major problem for the argument that UFOs are human technology. Even if we take what is the most conservative set of assumptions and say that the 2004 Nimitz incident from the FLIR video was the first ever legitimate UFO encounter, the idea that anyone anywhere on the planet had that technology almost 20 years ago stretches the limits of credulity. And to think that we potentially had it right after World War II, when UFOs first started to dominate the public consciousness, seems too far-fetched to even really be considered. And just this month, former director of ATIP, Lou Elizondo, said in an interview with British GQ, I have in my possession official U.S. government documentation that describes the exact same vehicle that we now call the Tic Tac, seen by the Nimitz pilots in 2004, being described in the early 1950s and early 1960s and performing in ways that, frankly, can outperform anything we have in our inventory. For some country to have developed hypersonic technology, instantaneous acceleration, and basically transmedial travel in the early 1950s is absolutely preposterous, end quote. Because, to be clear, what we're talking about with the technological capabilities shown isn't just a quantum leap forward. It shatters every rule and every paradigm we have. And even if some of that craft that we're seeing is human technology, it begs the question, where did we get it? Where did it come from? Because if it is us, the timeline of all of this makes it very hard to believe that we made these breakthroughs entirely on our own. And there's also the question of why the government would still be investigating UAPs if we knew what they were. We'll get into this more in future episodes, but ATIP, the secret government agency that investigates UAPs that was exposed in the New York Times and from which former director Lou Elizondo resigned in protest that same year, is not the first government agency to study this phenomenon. This has been studied by multiple government agencies at various levels of secrecy since at least December 1947. So why do all of this if we already know what they are? And for the everything is a PSYOP crowd, the most likely answer is that, you guessed it, it's a PSYOP. They say we can't trust anything that the government or anyone associated with the government tells us about UFOs. They point to Lou Elizondo, currently the most prominent face of the disclosure movement, and his background in counterintelligence and the fact that, despite resigning, he still maintains his clearance as proof that whatever the government is telling us about UAPs is being done to manipulate us to some nefarious end, probably war. And like I said, I hate this theory. I hate everything about it. But I'd have to be naive not to consider it. And I have. Deeply. But for me, when I listen to Lou Elizondo speak, I don't hear someone pushing a hateful, fearful agenda. He's not making the case that we should fight these things. In fact, he makes it clear that we're entirely outmatched by this technology to an extent that makes the idea of fighting with them almost meaningless. How could we fight something that can travel 80,000 feet in under a second? In fact, Lou actually seems to be saying something deeper and much more profound. Something that isn't just about the origin of this phenomenon, but about the origin of our species and the very nature of reality. In what has become one of his most quoted and most often referenced answers in an interview, when Lou was asked how he thought people would feel if they knew what he knows, he said, somber. He later explained his answer further in an interview with Kurt Jaimungle on his phenomenal YouTube channel, Theory of Everything, by saying, Imagine, imagine everything you've been taught, whether it's through Sunday school or through regular formal education in school or what our political leaders have told us. And yes, you maybe our mothers and fathers around the dinner table have told us or maybe at bedtime about, about who we are our background and our past. What if all of that turned out to be not entirely accurate? In fact, the very history of, of, of our species, the meaning what it means to be a human being and our place in this universe. What if all that is now in question? What if it turns out that a lot of the things that we thought were one way, are we prepared to have that honest question with ourselves? Are we prepared to, to recognize that we're not at the top of the food chain? 
And listen to his answer that he gave in an interview on That UFO Podcast when asked about research that he was doing with the Lakota people. Can you talk on the work you were doing with, uh, or you're going to be doing with the Lakota tribe? Uh, There seems to be a strong connection between Native American tribes and the phenomena itself. Well, Dan, once again, you're asking great questions, and I'll answer that one. Yes, we are absolutely engaged in that effort. Let's not forget that the First Nations of Saskatchewan, and frankly, most indigenous peoples have oral traditions that go back, in some cases, thousands and thousands of years, prehistory from our perspective. And to very much the same that an F-18 pilot is a trained observer when flying a combat mission, indigenous people are trained observers when it comes to their land. And although it might come from a slightly different paradigm than we're used to in the Western world, indigenous people have a profound sense of history. And it is that history that we are very curious to see if we can see some of the same patterns that we see in the current effort regarding ATIP. But even more importantly than that, I think, I think all indigenous people have, have lessons that we can learn from. I think we, in a, in a, we live in a very materialistic world that is heavily dependent upon technology. And indigenous people for, for millennia have gotten along just fine without it. And their sense of government and their sense of organization, their sense of fairness is truly profound. And I think if we can show the world just a little bit of that beauty, we might be better off. We might be better off as a civilization. We might be better off as a race, as a species. I'm not going to go into detail, but when I, when I had the, the, the distinct uh, honor of going up and meeting the chief and the elders of, uh, of the bands, the Lakota Dakota band. It was a, it was a profound experience for me. It was, it was an epiphany. I, I learned so much in that brief time I had with them. And again, I, I don't want to share the specific instances because I would like to eventually provide that in a much more professional manner for everybody to see. But it was, it was nothing less than soul shaking. And I mean that sincerely. I I realize there's a whole other aspect to humanity that we have seen to forget. And indigenous people have, despite the challenges they have faced over the years, whether it's disease or being moved against their will to reservations and the hardships and the discrimination that they have faced over and over again, somehow they were able to maintain their dignity and, and their humanity. And for me, it, it, was a, it was an understanding of resilience and that there is an indelible part of the human being, whether you call it the soul or the id or the chi or whatever, whatever nom du jour you want to give it, there's an element beyond the, the biomass of a human body and beyond the electrical synapses of the human brain and the intellect that makes each and every one of us distinct. And And I learned that there's great beauty in that. And coming from up from a hard investigator who has been always just a facts, ma'am kind of guy, you know, there's another aspect to being human here that not just me, but maybe, maybe other people have forgotten as well. Do you see what I mean? Honestly, if it wasn't for Lou, I don't know how far down this rabbit hole I would have gone. But the former director of a shadowy government agency whose core mission was to investigate UAPs quit in protest in order to pursue disclosure. And this is what he is saying? What could it all possibly mean? I don't know about you, but I'm hooked. Wherever this train is going, I'm along for the ride. And I hope you're coming with me. Because in the next episode, we're going to start exploring some of the alternative explanations for the UFO phenomenon, if it is, in fact, non-human technology. And we're going to start with talking about the one word I haven't said yet that you've probably been waiting for. Aliens. See you then. 